and joining us now to talk leadership, Waller Newell. He is a professor at Carleton University and the author of The Soul of a Leader, Character, Conviction, and Ten Lessons in Political Greatness. Welcome to TVO. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you here tonight. Well, your book is, of course, made up of what you believe to be the great qualities that political leaders have. But before we get to some of that, let's establish right off the top that you don't think there have been that many great leaders over time. Why so few, in your view? Well, I think it's a, it's a quite unusual combination of factors. It's, it's a combination of realism and idealism, which I think is difficult for people to come by. But it's also a question of extraordinary circumstances. And it may be that certain grave crises of war and peace, certain crises of international conflict, um, are essential really to bring out the qualities that we then deem great. So if you, if you don't live in consequential times, you can't really be considered a great leader? There is a long tradition to this effect, and I think it's often borne out in practice. It, it, it may say that life is not entirely fair in certain ways, but, but it may also simply be a, a true fact, I think. Well, on this important date in history, I should ask you, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, hugely responsible, obviously, for the fall of the wall in Berlin. Does he make your list? Uh, he makes my list as an extraordinarily important uh, world-shaping figure. I think that we'll continue to think for years to come, really, about what, what he embarked upon. I think he's also perhaps a great example of a leader who embarks on a course whose final end he does not entirely foresee. Or, or want, frankly. Or want, <laughs> and that he sets in motion certain forces that then escape his control, and they end up perhaps washing away more than he had himself intended. Hmm. All political leaders are, of course, politicians, but not all politicians are great leaders. What's the difference between a great politician and a great leader? I think, frankly, it's the ambition to achieve some truly great and good task for one's own people, perhaps even for the world, one that will be remembered by posterity, and that that drive for ambition and even that drive for honor is something that compels a leader to take the long view. So who makes that list? I think people like Lincoln, for example, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Churchill, uh, Pericles, there, there are many examples throughout history. Okay, the first three are on everybody's list, but yes. give me somebody from, say, 20th century uh, who we wouldn't necessarily automatically trip to who's on your list. Well, I think that in many cases the jury is still out on some of these figures. I think a case could be made that Reagan, perhaps again without entirely intending to do so, found himself in a position to achieve some really remarkable transformations, not only for America, but on the world scene as well. Sometimes it's a kind of retroactive judgment. Sure. The three C's, character, convictions, charisma. Let's talk about that now. One of the first lessons you draw from history is that character trumps brains. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's just a remarkable thing if you think about the fact that Lincoln, for example, or Churchill were not formally well-educated. They did not attend university. There have been, of course, leaders who were formally very brilliantly educated, but it doesn't necessarily translate into great success. Uh, no one, I think, would deny the sheer braininess, say, of Richard Nixon or Jimmy Carter. Many people would say their presidencies fell short of the mark. So I find it fascinating that there do seem to be times in which one's character is more important at least than, than formal education. There's a kind of instinctive knowledge or capacity to learn that sets certain leaders apart. I don't mean to take a cheap shot here, I really don't, but some people have observed that Michael Ignatieff is a big brain, but is there a lesson for him here in this comparison you've just made? Well, I think Ignatieff is an interesting, perhaps even in a way a slightly tragic case because he seems to have disavowed precisely the intellectual achievements that gave him a kind of lateral entrance into Canadian politics. He seems to me a man still in search of his identity, a, a work in progress at a rather late age. Is he too intellectual or too smart to be a good politician? I think he hasn't found a way of synthesizing those things in himself and drawing on them in a way that Canadians find compelling. You say a great leader must have moral convictions, I like this though, but only in moderation. Why is less more in this case? Because again, whether we like it or not, 
successful leaders have to have a kind of Machiavellian side. They have to have an instinct for the lesser evil. They have to have an instinct for the necessary compromise. Lincoln, I think, is the most compelling case in point. Abolitionists hated Lincoln with the same passion that uh, the Confederate slavers did. They regarded him as a gutless time server, as someone who did not have the pure spiritual fire to abolish slavery that they did. But in the long run, he was the one who brought it about. It's because he made many compromises they found distasteful. Who, who in Canadian political history would you put on that list of people who had moral convictions, but only in moderation, but were great Machiavellian leaders in some respect? I think Mackenzie King is a figure I've come to appreciate more with time. I think he's a person who, in many ways, brought Canada through some really extraordinary challenges, the same set of challenges that Churchill and FDR brought their countries through. But he was, uh, he was uh, a very banal figure, seemingly, uh, and uh, he, he hid his idealism beneath his pragmatism. And I think, <laughs> in retrospect, we would have to say he was a great politician, but he was a kind of gray blur. And our longest serving prime minister ever, so must yes, have had something going right. for him. That's right, that's right. Inspiring rhetoric is necessary, but again, only in moderation. Why so? Again, I think we saw with President Obama that, that he really sensed a hunger in the American electorate for inspiring rhetoric after the dismal rhetorical skills or lack of skills of his, skills of his predecessor. However, when one lavishes rhetorical skills on everything, at a certain point, I think, you tune it out. I think Reagan had this, this weakness. Bill Clinton tended to rhapsodize about everything in sight. And I think sometimes you have to deliberately tone the rhetoric down precisely so that occasionally you'll say something really memorable okay. that people will understand. Well, he hasn't even been president for a year yet. Are you saying that his kind of inspirational rhetoric has already lost a great deal of its currency at this early stage of his presidency? It's too soon to tell. But I, I do think that he has to be careful about how he measures this out now. Uh, he can't always reach the rhetorical heights for every single appearance that he makes in the Oval Office. Gotcha. Uh, inspiring rhetoric, of course, makes one think of charisma. And charisma, I'm guessing, is more important today in this 24-7 media age than it may have been a century ago. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say, and it's also changed its character because traditionally charisma meant a, a kind of legendary or godlike quality, a heroic kind of quality. But because of the way in which politicians are constantly exposed now to scrutiny uh, and to uh, a total saturation coverage of their lives, in a certain sense, withdrawal from view has become charismatic. In a certain sense, less is more. Again, I think Obama has some of this cerebral quality. There's something about his distance that actually makes him more alluring to people. Hmm. Let me read one excerpt from your book, and then we'll go join the others uh, sure. over on the other side of the studio. Virtually no politician today, you write, and certainly no presidential candidate, will openly admit that one of their motives is to derive public honor from achieving high office and serving the common good. At most, they will speak of, quote, the privilege to serve, their obligation, quote, to give something back in return for the blessings of my family and I have enjoyed. Why is this as big a deal as you apparently think it is? Because I think everybody wants to be known as just. If you ask anybody, are you just, they'll say, I am or I'm trying to be. Nobody wants to be known as ambitious, and no one will admit that they are. However, it seems to me that we can't really understand politics or political psychology unless we understand this factor of political honor seeking and how that ambition to serve can actually discipline more unruly passions. Now, politicians are not going to say this openly, but those of us who talk about politics and reflect on politics, I think it's sort of incumbent on us to explore this dimension of, of political psychology. Okay. Waller Newell, thanks for getting us started here. If you will, join me on the other side of the studio, and we'll join the others and continue our discussion. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You.